now we come to the closing session and the most important bi-directory session of today. Mr. Lee. By Ms. Shobana Kamineni, Executive Vice Chairperson, Apollo Hospital School. We have Ms. Shobana Kamineni is one of the most prominent leaders of Indian industry and the champion of integrated healthcare in India. Out of many feathers in the candle cap, Shobana is the first ever woman to be appointed as the National President of Confederation of Indian Industry, the CII. Can I also request Professor Rajendra Srivastava, Dean ISB, to chair this well lecture session. Shobna Garu, this is the last session and I mean the valedictory session but all of us are very sure that your words of advice will be long lasting and thought provoking into the audience. Thank you. Over to Dean. So, uh, thank you all. have to do a valedictory uh, because everyone wants to leave and get back that it's a Sunday. But I do think that this is an interesting subject. When you talk about diplomacy and how the economy counts, just look at uh, uh, Can you hear me okay? At the back. And, and uh, uh, my apologies for sitting. Uh, I had a knee replacement uh, three weeks ago, so you know I'm just getting back on my feet, literally. Having said that, coming to the subject, this Republic Day was kind of different from others. It's, it, you know, I think that it's one of the best things that India does, that we put our heart and soul of national pride, and we have a visiting foreign dignitary. Come and see this day, it's really special for us. But this year, we didn't have one or two or three. We had 10. The uh, Narendra Modi ji brought the entire ASEAN to us. And, and they were all, all there this, uh, uh, you know, this 26th January. And later in the evening, I had the opportunity to have dinner with them. But having said that, you know, so uh, this year alone, uh, that I was president of the Confederation, I've had uh, lunch with Angela Merkel. That was the third time I did that. We had parlays with Putin. We had uh, almost 30 world leaders, whether it's uh, Tea with Prince Charles and uh, uh, lunch with uh, lunch with the uh, Italian, the Italian president, the Turkish, the uh, Iranian, and uh, the Swiss Confederation, and and this just this list just goes on and on. Apart from taking delegations to uh, to Switzerland, to Singapore, uh, to Korea, to all these countries, and so why am I saying this? It's not just the fact. That, that, that I have a uh, that, 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 that I have a phone full of pictures with with world dignitaries, but the real importance of this is the fact that Indian industry contributes to eighty five percent of our GDP, and that's where it all you know that's where the pennies fall. When you contribute eighty five percent of the GDP, this is why uh, they they realize the the economics of diplomacy is as important. It's literally the oxygen. And like Michael Foreman said, you know, that, that it is the, uh, that, that, that it is economics that will move as much as, uh, as, as, the, uh, as, as the armies. And, and I think in many cases that's true. So having said that, most countries realize that our country is really doing a phenomenal job. Uh, one of, I think one of my most significant moments this year was that I was in a room with our ambassador from Korea and the, and the prime minister, and he had the ambassador mention that there was a trillion dollars of market cap in that room. And they came to India. This was the entire shabon of South Korea here in India together. And they themselves were shocked because these guys never traveled together. And all of a sudden, here they are talking to India to see. So this is where the economics of diplomacy really takes center stage, and, and that's the subject that I want to uh, really talk about to you today. And, and you know, it's nothing new. This is not something that the Prime Minister has done it really well, but it's not new. Even if you see who were the best people that did it, uh, they, they, in, in 1608, 
uh, over 1600, uh, the uh, East India Company, a small band of, uh, of businessmen, got together, and they were given uh, they, they, they were given the ability to trade with the entire East, with the Indies. And uh, 1608, they come. 1612, sign sign a, uh, a treaty with uh, with the Emperor Jahangir to trade. And then what happened? The rest is history. The economics took over. Uh, it took over the politics, took over an empire. And this is, you know, Britain, a small country, the United Kingdom, actually, you know, when they said the sun never set, they were the people who really took this economic diplomacy to another level. So I think history speaks for itself. But India hasn't been any slouch either. Uh, if you talk about 2,000 years ago, and even in BC, you see, there's so many instances that you will find India that is traded with the Roman Empire. That every time we meet our counterparts in the East, they feel so comfortable with, with the merging of cultures. This is because of the cross-pollination that has come. So there's a cultural connect that, uh, that you can actually, that makes our countries talk to each other a lot more easily. And this is done over years and years. So you know, there's a, historically, uh, there, there's economics that, that has defined uh, that has defined, you know, how countries uh, that how countries grow and how countries react and what happens. So moving to the present day, I think that uh, the ambas former ambassador Shamsar and I was having uh, a conversation with him, and he said, and I said, you know, the world is really growing so well. Here we are the, at uh, the world economy growing at three percent, uh, the U.S. growing at two two percent plus. Things are looking up. India, of course, the fastest growing. And he said, Chogna, that's true. But please remember that we, no matter how fast we're growing and how prosperous the world is, we're also at one of the most dangerous cusps uh, in the world. You know, in so many, uh, you know, so many times in this last year that we were brought to the brink of what we were, what we looked at as human existence almost. You know, when you're looking at North Korea, of course, it died down. And that's the reason why countries like South Korea are looking at a credible alternative. And that's why many of them come to India. And I'll get into the reasons of why some of these economic, uh, why some of the uh, diplomatic decisions are based on the foundations of, of the economy. But having said that, you know, so, so you look at countries, look, look at our East, where, you know, we have, uh, we have trouble in the South China Sea and that, and that area. Look at the West when you look at Syria and you look at Iran and sanctions and so much unrest even as close as Afghanistan and Pakistan. And all these areas you find suddenly India as such a prosperous nation that is sitting there. And, and, and here we are, not just the fact that, uh, that, that we have a large population, that we have an economy that is growing so fast and, and a, 2.5 trillion dollar GDP, but they're looking at us also as a credible alternative. And this is where diplomacy comes into play. When um, I was one of the first people actually that was sent to Nepal as soon as the prime minister changed with that. And and you know, the first dialogue, and whenever you're meeting these people of Sark, Sark is a word that India doesn't like anymore because we're, you know, that there's some countries that we don't appreciate. But having said that, we. They said, let business go. We have to make sure that business is understood there. And when we sat there around the table, they said, oh, you know, India, you all, you're all so big. You don't really care about us. I said, hold on. It might be that we have $2.5 trillion GDP, but our per capita is pretty much around what you all have. And this is where it becomes real. This is where we have to start talking to each other and why our neighbors become very important. If you look at the way that we work with, with Bhutan, or you see the way that we talk to Nepal, the way that, we, that we're engaged with, uh, uh, with Bangladesh, which is a great relationship, and I think a lot of credit to Bangladesh's past economic growth comes from uh, the partnership with India. Uh, what Bhutan does, the, our GST affected them, and our people were across the border, spent a week dealing with it, because how would goods go, what would happen to that economy. So you know whether what's happening in Sri Lanka. So each one of these is a case study and which is looked. So it's our immediate neighborhood which is important. 
but again, the larger neighborhood of how India plays in the region. And these are things that, you know, when it comes to economics, these are we're the first people that get sent. Because it just makes an easier uh, segue, you know, instead of talking diplomacy, when you can talk about jobs, that's what a country wants. And before I come to India and, and what we're looking at, I really want to talk to you about what would be the new diplomacy of the future. And, and you have to look at countries like, first understand that India, whatever people say, is the most open country in the world. With that, which other country, um, which other country has has allowed uh, FAG, FAGMA such free access? And you know what FAGMA stands for, right? Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, Apple, the, the Amazon. These are actually bigger than countries. Their GDP, the market caps are bigger than the GDPs of countries. And, and where else are they thriving and growing as fast? It's India, which is, and China never let them in. So, so China, on the other hand, uh, did another strategy. And for them, they have backed. So Baidu, uh, Baidu Alibaba and Tencent is equivalent to this bank. And, and they are growing faster. They have more patents than Google with this. And, and these are the people that will now create the new diplomacy. You will have to look at how those dynamics are going to change the world. This is super important. And, 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 and it's only a business person that will, will, will give you this kind of perspective. Why it's important that these people will start driving the way, uh, the, the, way the country's policies actually run with this. If you look at India today, we're supposed to be, retail is not allowed, right? Uh, foreign, uh, foreign retail is not allowed into India. But, they, but Amazon is everywhere with that. And, and so they're doing it, they're finding ways. So what, was, what we must understand is that these people have the ability to push the needle. And, and when it comes to diplomacy, we must push back. India has to find ways to push back to see where are those areas that, that we will start working on. And that's what I want to bring you to. This is the world reality, quickly from history to the present. And, and I just skimmed it because I'm not with the whole world. You're all in business, you understand these things. But I just wanted to bring it into the perspective of what's happening in India. So India today is the fastest growing economy in the world. We're very proud of that. I'm actually prouder of the fact that uh, the first quarter that when I took over last year as president of CII, the bottom dropped out because of uh, demonetization and GST. It, our growth was 5.7%, and everyone was stuck, you know, in deep depression. What would happen? Quarter after quarter, we came back to the fact that now we're looking at 7.5, and and the imperative that India needs to grow at eight and nine and even 10% for the next 20 years. And I, it, it, it's a wish. It's really a wish, but let me tell you why it's really necessary. The three reasons only, the, the hundred reasons, whether it comes from agriculture and, and all of you, uh, I'm as angry as you that that that, that uh, farmers, whether they're, you know, and, and I'm digressing, sorry, but it's a favorite subject of mine, that I really think that farmers in India today, whether there's a bumper crop or there is a drought, or there's a drought, their circumstance doesn't change. When, when there's plenty, the MSP is not enough for them to sell to cover their prices. When there's a drought, their their loans are their loans are waived. So we're teaching people, we're giving them fish instead of teaching them how to fish. But leave that, and I think agriculture is important for us. But having said that, I think the three economic reasons why India needs to grow fast. One, as you all know, is our demographic. We're not taking advantage of our demographic dividend like China did. They're really not taking uh, charge of it. If you see the need, the need is that the, that the people who are not employed or educated in any kind of job or training. So these kind of, you know, we have, or, and those figures will come out to you that there, that there are a million people that come a month. They're not, you know, they, they're not really a million people, but it's not that much less. Because certain number of them, this is people who attain the age of 
or 15, so some of them, you know, go back, go for higher studies, some of them uh, stay back at home, the women, and, and you know, so some of these things happen, but we have to create 8 million new jobs a year, and we have to reskill 2 million more, 2 to 4 million more that lose jobs. So net-net, it's a really tough situation. Any conversation that, that India has, has to come down to jobs and how we can make women skilled. The second, which is, a, which is a continuous subject in that, is inclusiveness. If you look at our inclusiveness, look at the Gini coefficient today of India. In 2000, uh, the, the, the top 1% of India used to, used to have 38.6% of India's wealth. Today, in 2017-18, we have 50% of India's wealth. And I think this is a dangerous trend. This is a trend that at 30%, that at 32%, actually one trump the election with that. So please understand, what are the economics of what's, what's, what's driving elections in this country? It's, it's a lot of it is driven through these inefficient inequalities. And, and, the, uh, and, and, and they say, Oxfam says, that if we can just keep it to the same level and it doesn't increase, we can take, in the next couple of years, we can, by 2019, we can take 90 million people out of poverty, just keeping it at this level. So I think there's a huge case for, for us to be able to lessen the inequalities. And the third one that I want to talk about, why India needs to grow and what we need it for, is the women empowerment. Here we are in a country that actually the women participation is dropping. And, and it's dropping for some good reasons, for some definitely not good reasons. But one of the reasons is that as people get wealthier, then, then they find that the women can sit at home. This is in the smaller homes. But what we feel is that if there's an economic imperative, if, you know, 17% of the women in the workforce, if you push this up to, to, to uh, uh, close to 30%, 27 to 30%, we can add $700 billion to our GDP. So I think that these three initiatives are some things that I want to talk to you when it comes to uh, when, when it comes to our economy and and how we need to progress from there. So coming back that that we assume that India is a great economy that India has uh, that everybody wants to come to us. So what what are the imperatives that we need to keep? So I met the um, I, I met the European. Union, the head of the European Union, and he had come back to India after seven years. He said, seven years we had completely stopped negotiating. We went into we went into uh, Argentina for the Buenos Aires for the for the uh, WTO talks, knowing that we were going to fail. And this is the stand that we're saying that India is unable to work on on multilateral treaties. And, and this is really the sad part of what we're working. While we say we're in an open, uh, we're, we're an open economy. Look at where our exports are. Yes, service exports have grown 14.7%. We're at 140 billion plus uh, this year. Um, unfortunately, our manufacturing ex exports are not growing at the same amount. And if you look at our current account deficit. It's actually uh, it's actually worsening because of oil prices and, and because of gold imports have gone up. But having said that, the imperative for us to have a strong export is undeniable for this. And 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 why do we have uh, why do we have tailwinds for it? One is the situation that I explained to you in uh, countries like Korea, or if you look at alternative markets like us building in Jabba, uh, so we can get the Iran and we have a pipeline with this thing. So these are the kind of simple, uh, but but if you look at EUs, if you look at, uh, if you look at England, for, uh, for instance, why are they quoting us? It's because post-Brexit, they need to they need to start working on treaty by treaty by treaty. India is one of the strongest investors into, uh, in, in, into, uh, the, um, into that market. Uh, I went to, uh, I went to the Middle East two, three times, and all those doors of Adya and all the investment banks have open again, despite the fact that they've had nightmares in India, whether it's e or whether it's EMAR, 
they've said we forgive you because we do know that these are the hurdles that, that come of a young nation that is just setting up systems. So what is it that we need to do to attract these people? Because we are a credible alternative, not just the fact that, that, uh, that we have this huge burgeoning uh, aspirational class that will continue to rise up as our GDP grows from 1500, I mean as our per capita grows and our GDP grows. These are the things that will start, uh, that, that are fundamentally attractive. If you look in Pune, the 300 German companies alone that have come up to this make in India, these are doing business. It's just really exciting. So they look at India as a large market, that's one. The second interesting thing is that do you know that 80% of most of the multinationals, and, and Mohan was sitting here, he, uh, and you could ask him, B.B. Monreddy, 80% of, of multinational companies have a research base in India. And, and, and that is really exciting. We might not create the next Ramanujama ourselves, but I can certainly tell you that Ramanujam will come from one of those foreign companies and Indians working in those there or Indians working abroad. So I think that's the excitement that we that we don't spend enough. In fact, we spend a pittance on R&D. That's another of my pet peeves between that. But the thing is that everybody comes to India. So this is something that we have to start working on. Large domestic market, uh, credible alternative for uh, this thing, R&D that can, that can be generated out of India. And I think more and more, if you see this Y2K opportunity is gone, that, that you can have bodies that can be transmitted, but, but the new opportunity is coming. And I think that is the next thing that India, the next wave of analytics and of, of, of platforms, of heuretics, and all of these that will start working, you know, that, that you'll have uh, thousands and thousands of people employed to service the world that, come, that can stay in India and not have to go anywhere else. And, and I think that that's the excitement and that's the opportunity in services as much as there is in uh, in, in the uh, uh, manufacturing. So this is where I'm coming from. And remember, money is very fungible. So money will come only when they see that the environment is right for it. So this ease of doing business, when they talk about the confidence uh, index of India, and I think that they're super important. The fact that we moved uh, 30 spaces uh, last year alone, and, and we're in, then, then we broke into the 100 of ease of doing business, it's really credit to the states. And Jay is sitting here, I know that. Uh, they talk about you a lot in Delhi with this, that. Uh, you know that the states are single-handedly driving some of this ease of doing business and it's important for countries to want to come in because money again you can put your you can take your business to ASEAN you can put it there you can export from Bangladesh or you can export so that's what business will do wherever it's easy wherever it's more convenient wherever you have access to markets and wherever, wherever you have the law that, that is strong and, and, and it's easy to do business. So I think that India needs to really work hard on that, on the economics of making all these things happen. So having said that, I think that I've taken you through this entire story. I'm going to wrap up only with one case study. And, and the case study is help with this. So, you know, I can't leave without that. And that's, a, that's an area that I know best. So I went. Uh, you know, two years ago, I went to the foreign. Uh, I, I, I went to our MEA, and and I said, you know, it's we get patients from everywhere, and and I think that's the best diplomacy when you can cure, when you can do a liver transplant on a patient from Pakistan. How I mean, that's that's love with this, and and that's the kind of thing that you can get. So I said, why are we not pushing this more? Why is India ceding this market to Thailand? Why are we ceding it to Singapore? Because we have the best doctors and our prices are just, you know, the, the pricing that India has, all of you know, whether it's drug pricing to the actual, uh, to the actual cure, the treatment is, is one tenth of all these countries. And I said, this is where India should play the big brother for our neighborhood and can be significant across. So medical diplomacy, and, and and the MA understood that. Of course, they were doing it a bit differently. They were just giving money 
to Maldives to build a hospital, forget about it, you know, that it would be shabby and uh, and badly run and probably give India a bad name because it had Indira Gandhi's name sitting on it. But you know, these are this is what was happening. And I think that's what we said, let's change the model. And then we started developing the model with Africa to say not only will we go in there with this thing, bring us your people, let us train and let us improve the capabilities. And I see this as a case of many, many areas. So I want to stop with that to say that, you know, diplomacy, how how uh, closely economics is linked with it. And I've just brought to you healthcare, but it's there in R&D, it's there in automotive, it's there in our space technology of, of the way that an ISRO satellite is, uh, an ISRO satellite carries a payload from Israel as well as it does from, from, uh, from the Middle East. That's fantastic and unheard of and it's true. With this, this is what happens, you know, that, that this is where diplomacy plays a role. So I've seen it and, and I'm a true believer of the power of what India can do. And I think that if I can take, if I can drive this home to you, saying that, that there's so much good, but there's so much work that needs to be done. And let's get started to move the needle on our economy, on jobs, on creating a better environment for business and uh, how can we move across because remember one thing, and I really believe that's true. While one in in times of crisis, when other countries are uh, when countries are creating uh, barriers, India is building bridges. So let me leave you with that thought. So, Maya, your enthusiasm, your optimism, is totally infectious. I've been watching the heads will be bobbing up and down. And so I think the audience is in total agreement with you. Uh, this is a wonderful address. So maybe we can take uh, one or two questions uh, from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, you're talking about our brand in terms of business and the business model. Uh, whereas when we look at uh, the most corrupt nations in the world, our brand is worsening. So how do you look at that? Uh, I think, and I know that it's there. Uh, there are many factors, and uh, corruption is definitely one of them. Uh, we're not going to move up that needle in ease of doing business unless we work on that. But if you see the competitiveness index in India, it is growing confidence. And I think it will really come when we stop that scarcity mentality with this. When you don't have to pay to get the service done, when you have more transparency, now they're looking at blockchain as technology that goes into almost everything. I've seen examples of Andhra Pradesh villages that are transmitted in Davos. Okay, there was actually a whole presentation around that. And I think that the world is excited and believes that that you know we will move to that space. Uh, but you know, it's I uh, I can't give you an answer because it's as depressing as this thing. And, Especially with elections around the corner. <laughs> may I That's one area that I'm not at all optimistic. May I support your optimism, though? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no not on this front. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, while we are number hundred on that uh, particular index, I think obviously we have to climb a long way up, and uh, and that is going on. It's uh, systems are slow to change, structures are slow to change, but it's happening somewhat steadily, but it's happening in the right direction. I would like to point out, however, that when you look at uh, companies, when you look at investments, and, and the question that is being asked is, what's the most attractive place to invest in? India is at the top of the heap. So we may be number 100, if you will, on ease of doing business, but you know we're pretty close to the top when it comes as a destination where people want to grow. And that's, that's part of, part, partly because, as you pointed out, it's because of the market. It's because of the human talent that is available in this country. So there are many good things happening, and ease of business is not the only factor that determines doing business. Clean cities, <laughs> corruption, corruption. All these. I mean, those, those are hindrances, but and they need to be and overcome. And actually move the needle when we look at those areas. And, and I think that India will make sure that if, if you look at it, just look at our renewable energy. 
with the fastest growing in renewable energy anywhere in the world. ISA was an India uh, initiative and which other 54 countries have signed up for it is because of India. So we are doing some good. Sure. But, uh, second answer, yes. Namaste, uh, ma'am. So I, I had a question about uh, opening the market, Indian market to the world. So you had compared India with China. So you told that uh, the multinational companies like Google, all they have, they enter the market of India and the profits go to those companies. But the China intelligently has done that. It has blocked the other companies and it has like it has given its own country's initiative so that they can enhance their own market and they can get their R and D the money from the market and they can develop in their own sense. So in this thing we are doing one thing wrong is they are opening up the market, they are giving uh, other people our land and we are building their companies here and we are just being lazy basically. And China is doing the work and it is it is putting its man force into the industry and we are getting some, some other owners from other countries and we are working from there basically. So we should also be little protective what our economy is. So, so can I stop you on that? Can, who, whose goods is Amazon selling? So, yeah, but the, whose goods is Amazon selling? Yeah, products it's, it's, selling. it's your small household, uh, household lady making papers or whatever. So, so the thing is that they might get an overall, uh, you know, uh, percentage of the top, and of course now they're losing. They're still losing money in India. They're, they're making money on our cloud services, so they're making money somewhere else, and it's funding this. Uh, in, in some ways, I do agree with you that we should have been China, but let me tell you a story about China that we should have figured out much earlier. It's not really the technology, but, but if you really look at manufacturing, in the 90s when India was closed, and, and we thought that being closed and protected was the best thing for us, that was the time China opened up manufacturing and today they have the biggest, the most agile and the smartest manufacturing. Whereas India, we can never play catch up. Our SMEs are still SMEs. And I think that was, so that's, a, that's an argument against protectionism at that point. So we have to be very tactical in the way that we do it. There has to be a give and take. And that's why India has never figured out how to participate in WTO. They always looked at us as blockers. If you look, we're not part of the uh, we're not part of the CCPA. We're not uh, uh, we're not part of so many multilaterals. But we need to start engaging. So I take your point, but we need to become smarter in the way that we engage. And and there is protectionism for the areas of agriculture that we need to do. And the other areas, I think that we should be a little freer because in the short term we might lose, but in the long term it will really open markets and bring investments in. So, so there's a there's a big economic argument. Uh, opinion have yes. We have yeah, run over time now. Sorry, sorry. No, no, it's it's okay. So, uh, I think it's been a, a wonderful valedictory address. I we could not have asked for more. Thank you so much. And, uh, we gave that insightful session and your valedictory address and your views, experiences and ideas in strengthening and role of business in strengthening economic diplomacy will actually work as a positive catalyst in accelerating and taking forward our continued dialogue on economic diplomacy for development. With this, now I request Dean Srivastava to present a memento as a token of our exploitation and happiness.